I hear you. So we're, we'll put the drink over here. So the other suggestion we're just ah. for my guests is traying. Are you comfortable with that? Yeah, I'm comfortable with that. Scoot doo, blabbery blue, scoot dee. Oh yeah! All right, <laughs> here we are. Here we go. Levels are good. Levels are great. All right. So this is my first time doing a podcast in the evening. I I always do it in the afternoon. I bought blackout curtains, and. For those of you watching on YouTube, I decided to wear my pajamas for this one because it's, an e it's the evening. I feel overdressed. Well, it's funny that you bring that up because you came wearing... May I, sh may I show them what yeah, you were wearing? Yeah, show them what I was wearing. Wearing... Which, by the way, these are awesome. Yeah, well, you know what? It's, it's new for me. I'm, a, I'm usually a high sock guy, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, my wife has been encouraging me to get like low socks for some of the, the, the sneakers she gets. I don't really buy any of my own clothes usually. It's really just sort of okay. whatever my wife dresses me up in. Well, let me put a little context real quick. Sure. You came in and uh, I asked you, and by the way, thank you for taking your shoes off. Oh, well, I'm, I'm happy to now. Yeah. So when you took your shoes off, you were a bit surprised. Uh, I don't think you were upset. You just weren't expecting it. Was not expecting it. And then from that moment on until about right now, there was a little bit, there was a little something off with you. And we figured out what it was. You didn't want to wear those short white socks on camera. Well, when I was crossing my leg, mm -hmm. I noticed that I didn't like the look of it. I, I just was... You, you didn't know, like the ankle showing I or the like, white I, itself? The, the combination of all of it. You know, I'm a... Uh, I, I'm usually very fully clothed in front okay. of people, and uh, you know, to see just a little skin under down there, you know, maybe a bit much. Okay, well, you know? we'll have you guys comment on in and let us know if you think that's too much. <laughs> but for the rest of the show, you're wearing a pair of my socks. I'm wearing. I feel <laughs> like I belong in the apartment now. I really want to start selling. Take your shoes off, socks. You should. Would you? Of course, as a guest, there would be of no cost to you if I sent you a pair. Would you ever? Would you wear them? It depends what they look like, but probably. Right. Well, obviously, I can't on it. I more likely to wear them then. You would. Uh, <laughs> you would prefer a sock than a short white. I would probably prefer the short white. Okay. Uh, is that? Did I just hear a phone go off? Is that you or is that me? That was me. That's you, man. And it's a girl. Ah, wow. Okay, so you know. Go ahead. Go. You go ahead. No, 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 no. Let me have a sip of my whiskey. <laughs> So I'm not much of, oof, geez, I don't know why people do this. <laughs> I'm not much of a drinker. Um, but before a guest comes on, I like to make them comfortable and I offer them a coffee or a tea or a joint, a weed chocolate, whatever it is they'd like, I would like them to have the options. And you told me that you'd have a drink on camera. Sure. Question, do you smoke weed? I have smoked weed. Okay, is that something that you'd be comfortable talking about? I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. Well, because I could always edit anything out, but how about the, how about that <laughs> joke? <laughs> gotcha. You'd rather talk about that. I'd rather. I'd rather. Uh, no, I'm saying I'd rather edit out the <laughs> joke. Oh, oh, I, th I thought that was fun. I thought it was fun too, but these are different times. Your name is Hurwitz. It is Hurwitz. You know, so they'll just take it out of context. I'll tell you what I'll do. The first time we tell it, I will bleep it. I had there was no issue with you making the <laughs> thing. It was me commenting that I'd prefer the <laughs> socks, which was. Me, I believe, obviously kidding around, um, but you, know, you never know these days. So, so you're, I, I, I think you're being serious right now. I am being serious. So you are a bit worried that that joke might be taken out of context. Yeah. I wonder if I don't think about it enough or you think about it too much or if there's somewhere in between. Because to me, nowhere in, nowhere in the world is that something that's like, oh, he's just a Jew saying... You didn't even say anything anti-Semitic. So you live in a comedy club, which is great. That you live in in you right. know the safest space in the world. It's the best. And be, and, and I'm even uh, though you do comedies, I do comedies, but it's uh, it's a different world these days. One hundred percent. Yeah. But I didn't think that was crossing a line. But you know what, viewers, let us know what you think about the short white socks <laughs> and the <laughs> joke. And worst case scenario, we'll take it down. But <laughs> I love that. Uh, I want to I want to uh, comment on on the whiskey I'm drinking. You sure. said yeah, I'll have a drink with you. I didn't say do you want to have a drink with me. I said would you like a drink? Had you said yes, I would have never have thought to pour myself a glass. But you said I'll have a drink with you. It's nighttime. I'm in pajamas. I haven't seen you in a little bit. Yeah. 
it, something about it was very romantic. I poured myself a cup. It's it's great. You know, you you offered an array of things, and I was like, the muffin is that? I you offered a muffin. Yeah. That was one of the choices, and I I thought about that long and hard. I <laughs> I wanted the muffin. But you know, I was like, "Do I am I ready to just start digging into a muffin right now?" If like, you knew it wasn't on camera, would you have said yes to the muffin? I don't think so. Okay, I, I probably wouldn't have. I have had three sips of this, and yeah. maybe it's in my head. My mom gets like this, and I never believe her. But I think I'm feeling it already. I'm trying to get you drunk. You notice I haven't had any of mine. Yeah, I have <laughs> noticed. <laughs> I'll get in here. So. We've known each other for years, yep. and as far as I'm concerned, we became friends in October of 2016. I, that's probably about, that's where we became actual proper friends, yeah, I'd say. Yeah, that's when we started texting each other as opposed to Twitter. So I kind of want to tell tell the story of how, how we met. Is that okay? Sounds great, of course. And please, because you're the guest and I talk way too much, chime in, cut me off, correct me as much as possible. I'll do everything I can. Thank you. So we met years and years ago through... Uh, a, 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 a once was work acquaintance of yours, Matt Lotman. Yes. He ran some stand up comedy shows and we became friends and he introduced me to you and we had what we call in the biz a general. Yes, we did. Yes. A general, for those of you that don't know, is a meeting that is serves no purpose, but you feel like, oh, I'm going to be successful because I'm meeting people now. Incidentally, out of all the generals I've had, three of which I've maintained relationships with. All right. You were one of them. Who are the other two? Allison Jones, and I have to imagine there's a third. <laughs> <laughs> I have to imagine. Well, Allison Jones is fantastic. I actually just saw the movie Booksmart last night. How was it? It's really fun. Great. Really, really enjoyable. I think people are going to love it, but... She cast that movie, and every last uh, person in the in the film is awesome. She's fantastic. Allison Jones cast she. You know she did the Golden Girls. She did Fresh Prince. She did Four Year Old Virgin, The Office, Super Bad. I mean, she's one yeah. of the greats. We're gonna get her on the podcast soon. Amazing. So you and I were friends on Twitter. Um, well, you know, we followed each other, and every now and then there was a, a reply or a like, and it was great. So long story, kind of short. I had. Uh, Talked to some girl on Twitter. We had never met before, but we were kind of flirtatious with each other. And she lives in L.A., but at the time she was working in Hawaii. So she was going to come back to L.A. and we were going to get a coffee that weekend. And she couldn't. So I suggested, how about we get a coffee in Hawaii as a joke? She said, yes, on a, on a Tuesday, I bought a ticket. I got there on a Friday. I'm in Hawaii for the first time. It was time. a big deal for you. I remember it was, you know, you were doing something spontaneous. Yes. And... Uh, I think you felt very alive that weekend. Well, I don't leave my house. Uh, the reason this is called Take Your Shoes Off is because I need people to come into my living room, get comfortable, take your shoes off. But also, I have a lot of n neuroses, and I n actually, I need you to take your shoes off. I have nice rugs, you know? I, I realized when I walked, I walked probably four steps into your place, and I really unnerved you by having my sneakers on as long as I did. I don't think you noticed, but I also realigned your shoes because you had one shoe on top of part of a flip-flop, which to me is mental, but people do it. <laughs> so um, I don't leave the house and I don't go, that means I don't go on dates. Sure. And my therapist has suggested, not even necessarily going on dates, but when my friends say, hey, do you want to go swimming or play tennis? Even if you don't like to swim or play tennis, just go do it. So I was in a, I was in like a pocket of, I'll leave the house, but I wanted to do these big gestures to like give myself a story or something. Sure. Man, I'm getting hot even telling the story. I think, I'm not sure, if, I think it's because I'm nervous because I, I feel like I need to censor this story because some of this information doesn't just, isn't just my story to tell. Sure. And I'm getting a little insecure, but I do want to tell the story. Well, we can talk about the story. You could... Yeah. But there's also personal information on, on my end, on the girl's end, and your end. Well, you don't have to go into all the details okay. of... of... So, so I'm, I'm in Hawaii and... I'm meeting this girl on Saturday morning, and I have the night to myself. I'm in Hawaii. I have no weed. I tweeted out, hey, oh, see, and here's another thing. I'm getting hot. I get so hot because I don't know if I'm telling other people's business. Am I allowed to talk about you and you, weed? You can talk about this. I, th I need to take one breath. Hold on. Okay. I don't know if you could tell. I'm turning red. I'm sweating. I'm drinking. You, I can't tell. <sighs> okay. You're going to be all right. Yeah. It's going to be okay. So... I tweeted, does anybody have, if any, who's, is anybody in Hawaii that has access to weed? I think what I tweeted was, 
Hey, Ron Funches. Yes, you're asking Ron. Will you please retweet this? Because he always, people just, I've, I've featured for Ron and people just bring him weed. He doesn't even ask for it. And you tweeted me back. You said, hey, if you find any, let me get some. <laughs> and I said, are you in Hawaii? Not only were you in Hawaii, you were on the same island as me. We were staying in the same hotel. Then I found out you were staying in the same hotel with me. Yes. And you had reservations at the at the restaurant at the hotel. Yep. Excuse me. <laughs> I also haven't figured out the instinct. Do I edit out burps and pauses like that? Howard Stern does not. Yeah, so. but I'm not Howard Stern. No, but you know, you're tall like Howard Stern. You've got, you know, curlyish hair like Howard Stern, you know, wavy. Okay. You know, you're Jewish like Howard Stern. Yeah. So, like, you have some of the same traits. You None of the different. traits, all the traits that you mentioned were about the way I look, and he's literally a radio personality. Well, you're trying to be sort of with this. I'm trying way too hard with this. It's not bad. So far, so good. You know, not bad used to be okay with me, but now if I don't get an applause, I think it's I, a miss. This is, so I have to just, like, clap after everything you say here? Do you have to clap? I mean, it, I, I, I would it, suggest it, it. If I'm feeling the clap, <laughs> yeah. do I do it? Yeah. All right, okay, here we go. Okay. I'm just going to do it the whole time. So you you were in Hawaii, incidentally, um, f- uh, meeting with somebody who was working with a, with a person that I was going to go meet. Yes. And so we were staying in the same place. And up until that point, I probably haven't had a drink in how many years? I don't know. I don't drink. So you only drink when you're with me, which is a crazy Since thing. Since then, I have, I have I, every now and then I have a drink. But it's weird because I don't view myself as the bad influence, get a guy to drink guy. So it's interesting. Interesting that, I, that you associate somebody drinking as being a negative influence as opposed to just getting them to drink. You know what? That's a good point. I'm having a drink. I'm not driving. I'm in my pajamas. My shoes are off. You're yeah. applauding me. This is the best night of my life. Well, it's better than most probably. So I went down and I had a couple of cocktails. I had a couple of, uh, we had a, I don't remember what I ate, but there was multiple options. You guys picked up the tab. Did we? Yeah. I offered. Yeah, well, I you know, we were feeling good. We were feeling really uh, good. That you day. don't remember picking up the tab? I don't remember picking up the tab. I'm not surprised, but I don't remember it. Do you pick up the tab a lot? It depends on who I'm with. See, here's here's what I know about you. When, we, when I first got to Hawaii, this is John Hurwitz, the guy I had a general with a while ago. He directed Harold and Kumar movies, American Reunion, and, excuse me, wrote and directed. Sure. And when I met you, I met you in your office with your name on it. So I'm thinking this guy's a big wig. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's so funny. It's, and, and, and then to see a big wig come in and want to change their socks because their leg is up, uh-huh. we're all just humans and we're insecure about everything. It's so, you know? it's so funny what people view as a big wig. You know, I, uh, I certainly don't view myself as a big wig in any way. So it's interesting uh, to see the... Do you, do you, you view yourself as, as someone with influence or, and success in this business? I'd say some, yeah. Yeah, that's a big wig. Sure, I guess so. I you guess know, John so. Apatow. Yeah, I mean, not, I'm not there. We got to get him on the podcast. I mean, I can try to help. No, I'm just kidding. Do you, have his, do you have his number? I do not, no. Who's the biggest wig you have phone number um, in your phone? I, I don't know. A huh. big wig. Tell me a big wig in your phone. I mean, of course, John and Cal from the Harold and Kumar movies. I mean, they're not, I don't know if they're big wigs, but. I don't know if that's a big wig. That's yeah. like. That's like the caliber of guest I think I could get right now. You think so? I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Those guys, I think they're, they might be a little higher than you're giving them credit for. They're way higher than me. <laughs> I'm here. They're, I consider them above me in okay. terms of a podcast guest. And, and I gave you the Hollywood mug and you were the highest. So okay. Yeah. So at this point, I mean, I would view them as higher level podcast guests than I am. They're, well, hard, they're harder to get maybe right now. Um. So while we're on the topic of bigwig, I want to talk about what what defines that and and what what's going on and and what's so cool about you guys at home listening in on on the uh, I can't remember the name of the, the podcast. Uh, take Some, your, take something your, about the shoes, take your yeah. shoes off. I have this. I don't know if you know this about me. I have this ability to get people to reveal things that they would otherwise never reveal. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I'm sure this. I'm going to regret this. Compl- I already regret it. I'm going to be clear. I already regret it. I'm going to regret it, regret it more. <laughs> you regret that you that you agreed to this because? <laughs> no, no. Because I, uh, this is like a magic trick what I'm able to do. No, I, of course. I feel very comfortable. I'm in your apartment right here. Yeah. It's like the whole world isn't going to see this. I mean, this is going to be the biggest podcast of all time. So. Going to be honest with you, there's probably not too many people are going to see this. Hmm, well, you know, at least we will. 
I don't think I will. You don't think you'll watch it? I'm, I'll send you a highlight. <laughs> yeah, you'll send me the highlights. Um, but I can't. I can't get into it now. I ha- I can't just get the secrets out of you. It has to be organic. So I'll have I'll have some moments. Slowly but surely. But I would like to start with a little bit of background. Sure. This this could be um, what's the word I'm looking for? This could be a little procedural. This part. Okay. I have heard from guests, both on my podcast and others, that they don't like to talk about themselves. Okay. Is this something that is is an issue for you? I'm. Uh, it depends what you're, what kinds of questions you're asking. But I mean, what's your I, biggest fear? My biggest fear. Hmm. Everything, anything to do with, you know, my family's health, that kind of stuff. It's hmm. a, it's a safe answer. I'm just. I mean, that legitimately is the answer. Yeah, I was trying to get something like big secret thing out of you. I try to. No, that's it's not working. Yeah, I mean that. Well, it, I did answer honestly. Yeah. Uh, give me a second. Here's where I'm gonna have a, a clock swipe go mm-hmm. <laughs> for four hours and then be sweating. No, but what I would like to know is is uh, uh, the origin story. Sure. You're from New Jersey. I am. Yes. Is this is this your is this your introduction to Cobra Kai? Yeah. Oh, you mean uh, you mean Karate Kid and? Oh, I buried the lead. I buried the lead. That you when you were in when we were in Hawaii, that's what you were telling me about. This yes. was pre Cobra Kai. It was pre Cobra Kai. Yeah. I, I'm a huge as everybody of my generation, huge Karate Kid fan. Sure. This was not even announced. I don't even know if. You... No, no, it was early. I'm trying to remember what stage we were at. You had just gotten one of the guys to agree, but not both. Okay, so, so who this would that was have been? super. It was uh, uh, William Zabka. You got point. so you got Johnny Lawrence to agree. Yes, and you needed Ralph. Yes, and once you have Ralph Macchio, then what is greenlit? Once we had Ralph Macchio, it was uh, pitching it around town and trying to find a home for the show. So you need to get them before you're pitching. They come to the pitch. Yes, they did. Now I also noticed that Will Smith is an executive producer. Is this because he has some rights with? Could sure. you tell me how that works? It's uh, you know when we came up with the idea for the show, we said okay, well before we do anything else we got to figure out if we could have any access to the rights to karate kid so we asked our agents who has the rights to karate kid and it turns out that the lion's share of the rights are with will smith's company overbrook from when they made the remake with jaden smith um so where do you come up before you even get to that where do you come up with the idea to to do this uh this was this was a long time coming this was something that you know, myself and uh, my writing directing partner for years, Hayden Schlossberg, we've done everything together in, the, in this business. And a third friend of ours, Josh Heald, who was my college roommate all four years. Oh, I never knew how you guys knew each other. Yeah. So Josh and I met freshman freshman year in the hall in the same hall. And then we lived together the rest of college. Um, and where did you go to school? Uh, University of Pennsylvania. So uh, uh, we Hayden and I moved out here first. Uh, Josh moved out here a year later. Uh, Josh has also, you know, eventually made the Hot Tub Time Machine movies, whereas we were making Harold and Kumar and the other things you mentioned. And when you say making, he wrote them. He yes, he wrote the the Hot Tub Time Machine movies. Right. And um, every night, like uh, you know, in our early twenties, it would be we'd work all day, and then at night, you know, Josh would come over to our apartment, and we just watch movies and TV shows and all that stuff. And one night, we were watching a. Um, uh, the Karate Kid special edition came out and there was special features with interviews with the cast because mm-hmm. we were huge Karate Kid fans like you. Um, and uh, we were always big William Zabka fans. One thing, like backing up even further, uh, when I was in high school, I was a huge Zabka fan. I would I called him 80s asshole. That was, I don't remember him in anything other than Karate yeah. Kid. So he was also in Back to, the, Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield right, where right, he was the, yeah. di- the diving asshole. Uh-huh. Uh, he was in Just One of the Guys. I don't know if you know that mm. movie, but it's a uh, you know, uh, girl is girl dresses up like a guy to see if she can you know have more success as a guy. So the opposite uh, you know, writing of Lady Bugs. Paper. Is it, it was the opposite of Lady Bugs. It was the same as She's the Man. Yeah, it was an earlier incarnation of She's the Man, basically. And Zabko played the asshole in that. Uh, he was an asshole in uh, I think European Vacation. So he was like an asshole in four movies in the eighties. So and you're a legit fan of his from that. I was a huge fan from them so much so that in the movie Just One of the Guys, which you haven't seen, he would wear like a weightlifting glove, like a fingerless glove, yeah. and like lift lunch tables and pick on nerds in that kind of way. And I, ironically, <laughs> like as a joke, would wear, in high school. 
got a glove like that and would go around and joke around about about Zapka all the time. Loved Zapka. Um, um, the, you're a, a little bit older than me. Yes. Is was Zapka like a name? Because to me, I only know that name because I'm a Karate Kid fan. I don't think ever, most people didn't know his name. I knew his name because I was, you know, somebody who loved movies. Right. But like, I nicknamed him '80s asshole. I wasn't calling him William Zapka to people. I'd be like, oh, you know, '80s asshole, and I would say that, and they'd be like, oh yeah, yeah. That people knew him from that that stuff. So I was a huge <laughs> Zapka fan early on, like a huge Karate Kid fan, huge Zapka mm-hmm. fan as well. Um, and then. Fast forward again, it's, you know, we're watching the Karate Kid special features and we what were- special feature was it, something it, new it, to you? It, it, was, it was him doing an interview about his role in the Karate Kid. It was behind the scenes kind of stuff. And was it during the time or was it like it was present filmed, day at that time? I think it was filmed later. I think okay. it was- So uh, he's older. Uh, yeah, he's older. And he was talking about his experience making the Karate Kid and his approach to the Karate Kid was- he just viewed himself as the hero of his own story that he was, you know, he says at the beginning of the movie, I'm an ex degenerate. Um, I'm turning over a new leaf basically. And he's, he's got one year to make it work. And then at the end of the movie, you see that like when crease is telling him to sweep the leg, he looks like he doesn't want to do it Mm -hmm. at the end. He hands the trophy to LaRusso. So in his mind, this was like a kid who was trying, who had a breakup with a girl that he loved, was trying to get over it. Some kid moved to town and he's sort of struggling there. And, you know, acting out in certain ways and he has a sensei who's taught him uh you know to strike first strike hard no mercy right so the long and the short of it is he viewed himself as the hero of that movie in his own way when he was acting in the film and we started to talk about like what happens to that bully when they grow up like you know we we, you know hayden josh and i would talk about like the bullies we do in high school and like where are they present day and we're like hey wouldn't it be great to like do a movie about the bully wouldn't it be great to do a movie called cobra kai stars johnny lawrence and instead we're like picking up it's at the time it was i guess you know whatever 20 years after the movie had come out and we see his life and we and we figure out where daniel is and it was something that we talked about but in the film business we had enough experience in the film business at that time to know that like studios are not going to green light a movie starring ralph macchio and billy zapka and put the the all the money behind it in the way that you would want so we're, we're just like, okay, that's never going to happen. Then the Jaden Smith movie happens, and we're like, okay, it's really not going to happen. Why? And because? Just because there was already, they, they were already remaking Karate Kid. The ship had sailed. There's no way that's going to happen. And then some time passes. And, you know, with the invention of sort of like streaming television right. with long form narrative, you start to, you know, watch these longer stories that were interesting. And then there's the nostalgia kick. Something like Fuller, Fuller House comes out, and you're driving down the Sunset Strip, and you see Kimmy, Gil- Kimmy Gibbler on billboards suddenly. And you're like, Kimmy Gibbler is not famous from anything other than Full mm-hmm. House. And she's able to be on a billboard because people love Kimmy Gibbler. Um, and so I'm like, well, people love Johnny Lawrence. People love the Karate Kid. People love Daniel Russo. Like, why not that? So that's when we started saying, hey, maybe we can approach this uh, through a different angle and do it as a long form television show. So what's the first that you think, Okay, now now the world is ready and there is a media that would allow this to happen. Yes. Where's the first step of getting in touch with William Zabka? It was well, William Zabka, by then we knew a bit. So for my first interaction with William Zabka, you guys had a general. No, we did not have a general that that's he was too big time for the general with me at the time. Okay, that's. You know, no offense. Oh, please. <laughs> yes, no. But no, he. I had just moved here. No, it was. It was actually when we were making Harold and Kumar Escape from Guantanamo Bay, Hayden and I had written a scene in there where um, Harold and Kumar um, go, go to sleep, and Harold has a nightmare. And in this nightmare scene, uh, William Zabka, basically playing Johnny from the Karate Kid, is. Ho- hooking up with Maria, who's Harold's love interest in the movie. And there's this whole thing, and he's kind of antagonistic towards uh, Harold in a very you know surreal kind of way. So we tried to hire Zapka for it. We sent him you know an offer and sent him the the script pages, and he passed. He was not interested in sort of doing the Johnny Lawrence kind of thing in that context. He did, you know, if he was going to act in something, he wanted to you know do something different. and he just passed on it and respectfully passed. We never spoke with him. What does respectfully passed mean? It was the the word. The what we got back from his reps was he wanted to make a point of saying that he really appreciated you guys thinking of him for this, but he's not looking to do this kind of thing. So he he really he just is he doing he, any what before Cobra Kai has he had he been do, doing acting work in he, the past he, ten years? 
uh, it wasn't until I mean he had done you know minor stuff, but like it wasn't until a couple years later, Josh Heald, our other partner, mm-hmm. is making Hot Tub Time Machine, and they were doing some reshoots. Yeah. So there was this part, and they're like, "We can, let's try to get William Zabka for that." And William Zabka signed on and yeah. did that role because it was not a Johnny Lawrence thing; it was a different kind of character. And Hayden and I visited set that day, and so Josh had met him there, and we met him there as well. And he told us that he's like, the reason I'm here doing Hot Tub Time Machine is I regretted not doing Harold and Kumar hmm. uh, a couple years ago. And I didn't want to like regret that again. I'm gl- glad to meet you guys. And we all got along great then. So we were like, Josh was more in touch than with him than we were, but we were a little bit in touch with him over the years. Did you tell him about that. the glove and, and all that stuff at the time? I've to- Not then. I've told him that stuff since then. It probably creeps him out. You uh, think so? Uh, probably not really. I think he has a good sense of humor about it. I and, sometimes, and, when I meet people uh, and there's a specific memory I have from being younger, I always tell them, and, and I have been told that it could come off a little bit like, eh, don't you, but like, well, I want to like tell them that, that's things. That's my attitude with it. It's like, I, I don't give a shit. Like, you know, like the bottom line is I'm a genuine fan from back in the day. I view everything, like I've always been like a, you know, a guy who views things comedically. Mm -hmm. I thought it was hilarious at the time. I think it's hilarious now that I did that back then. I I have pictures. I'm going to put it on Twitter at some point. I I found some photos from my project graduation. It was the night that I graduated high school. And there's a photo of me giving Hayden a wedgie with uh, the hot hand on. But you can't see the hot hand. We'll put it right here. You'll put it right there. Perfect. Yes. Um. So you meet you meet him you guys, you know or you guys ex- you know talk you know who yeah. you are and then when do you think all right let's try to make this happen so what uh, we decide you know this was you know years later so like when we finally come around see Kimmy Gibbler billboard come up with the thing get get the rights uh, and once we had the rights get the rights don't don't step over that because I don't uh, know how that works what so, does get the so, rights mean? so as we reached out. To Will Smith's company. Because you knew your agents told you Will Smith has rights. Will Smith's company has the rights. Right. So we met with Caleb Pinkett. Okay. So he's an exec over there. And he's as big a fan of the original Karate Kids as we Mm -hmm. are. So it was one of those things where it was like, we're nervous. We're like, okay, you know, they're making the Jaden movies. You know, maybe they're not, maybe they don't love the old ones in the ways that we do. Maybe they're, they're not looking to go back there. Caleb could not, Caleb is exactly how we are about Karate Kid has seen it a zillion times is immediately talking about Dutch and like my, you know, smaller characters with us. Um, we pitched him for like 45 minutes, just sort of stream of consciousness, telling him all of our thoughts. And then like, he was sort of silent and just smiling and enjoying himself. And then at the end of it, he just went off. He's like, I love this. I love this. I love it. And he remembered like every like specific names of minor characters that we were pitching. Hmm. He just like has one of those memories where he just, he took it all in, spit it back out to us. Everything that he loved had great insights. And he's like, I will definitely, I got to make this happen. So he, he internally, you know, went to the team at Overbrook and said like, these, these guys have this great idea. Like we gotta give them the right, give them the rights to it, and let's be a part so of this. Work, so they own the rights; they literally bought the rights. So yes. they, it's up to them. Yeah. So the, it's their decision. Yes. And then, are they loaning them to you? Or are they just allowing no, you? They're to al- do they're it? They're allowing us to do it. So it's you know uh, they have the rights, and then Jerry Weintraub's estate, Jerry Weintraub, the producer. Mm-hmm. So and and they knew the people at Jerry Weintraub's estate. So they're like, we'll speak to them. Um, do you meet Will Smith at any point during this? I still have not met Will Smith. Will. S- Will is king to me. He's the best. He's, num- he's the I, number one. I'm, he he's always all over the world. Like I don't expect to be able to meet him. He's not he's not blowing through their offices. He's busy on film sets like every moment of the day. Man, still it was it's cool to see Will Smith up there, even if it's just because he has it the feels rights. great. Like you're it, connected. It to feels him great. Uh, it feels really cool. Um, I've heard that he's supportive of the show and that he likes the show. Great. Um, so that's great. We so, got to get him on the podcast. Yeah, I think that's we nice. Got to get him on the podcast. I, I think. I th- is, that, is this my task now? I, listen, <laughs> You're saying there's we. no obligation, <laughs> yes. but I'm saying like, yeah, we, you know. I like the idea of I get him on the podcast and I still haven't met him. <laughs> um, yeah, but we could put up a picture of you with the glove and show it to him. I'm and, sure he'll be very impressed. So you go in. He says, "Great." Let's you guys make it happen. Does he help you make it happen? Do you what do you what's your next move? You got to get Ralphie. Yeah. So the next move, uh, you mean so meeting Zapka or, or well, Zapka's in. No, right. No, so after after we get the rights, we go. We take Zapka to lunch. 
we explained, where you go. We we went to a, a Mexican restaurant that was near where he was. And to see, no, why having lunch? Do you just say no? I wanna- no, we're just the three of us wanted to sit down and talk to him about an idea. Hey, I have an idea. Let's get some lunch. Is Mexican okay? He says sure. You guys meet up. He says so. What's going on? He has no idea. He has no idea. Okay. So we go and there. You guys have a pitch ready to talk. We to have him? a full on pitch ready to talk to him about it. And we just blew his mind. It was one of those things. He like thought it was like a hidden camera show. Basically, he was waiting for people to come out and basically be like, uh, you know, that were that were fucking with him. But, sure. I mean, this is his biggest thing that he's done, and now we're, here's a revival in a new, fresh way. How could he not? Yeah, do and it? and just the fact that we had the rights, like that was the thing that really blew his mind. That like we had all this idea, and he's like, "Wait, I'm I'd be playing Johnny Lawrence." Like actually, we were like, "Yes," and like Ralph would play Daniel Larusso, and. It, like we had to kind of he was so stunned that like we had to like explain it to him a couple times and he'll tell the story that like yeah like he he didn't know what to think and he left that meal just being like i'm in if you could get ralph and he knew from his experience that like over the years people have approached them about doing karate kid things a zillion times and ralph has never been interested he's always said no to everybody there's never been the right idea for him and you know, if he was going to make that move, it's a big deal. Is, are Ralph and Zapka friends, or they just they are they are friends? Yes. So, and he says, "Listen, Ralph doesn't bite on this." He's kind like, of stuff. he's like, he doesn't typically, but he heard Billy knew that our how what our idea was. Billy thought it was a great idea, and that it was different than anything they've been hearing. Um, and he thought, you know, we have a shot. You know, I think he, you know, was familiar with the work that we had done. People liked, uh, and he knew that Ralph would know that as well. So. It was one of those things where he was like, if there's a shot, this is probably the shot. Okay. Um, so uh, we ended up, the three of us flew ourselves to New York, where Ralph lives. And you you set up a meeting with him first? We set up a meeting with him first. And what do you say? Hey, we have a meeting. Uh, it's a secret no, again? It, no, this one, this one was like, they're talk- they have an idea for a... Uh, a Karate Kid continuation series. And who does this? His agent? Um, his his agent. We spoke with his agent. Like, this wasn't a situation where we just said, hey, like, our agent, just call his right. agent. Because you that. knew Zapka. It was more mm-hmm. casual. Yeah, this was something where, like, where we arranged to speak with the agent on the phone. We pitched the idea to the agent in the short, in short form pitch. Um, and we, you know, basically insisted that, you know, he support the idea of us sitting down with ralph and he was like listen you know i don't know if ralph's gonna go for this but you know i have a a, a question that's that's maybe a a little silly but for for people that might be interested on how this kind of stuff works because this is my this is what i'm wondering all right we need to get ralph on board that's the that's the that's the missing piece right now so I'm not speaking directly to Ralph. I have to speak to his agent, who's then going to speak to Ralph. Do you want to give the agent material for Ralph? Do you trust that the agent's going to do it? What is the short pitch you tell the agent? I'm trying to remember the specifics of this. It was more It was more like, you know, we're very aware of Ralph's position when it comes to Karate Kid materials. Not only have we spoken to Billy, but we've watched a zillion interviews with Ralph. We're g- genuine fans. We know that he's hesitant, but he's never fully closed the door on this. Our idea for the show, it's called Cobra Kai. We go in through the eyes of Johnny Lawrence, and its you'll see Daniel LaRusso in a whole new light. We have this very well thought out. It's not a parody. It's not a simple comedy. It's not necessarily what you would expect from the people who brought you Harold and Kumar and Hot Tub Time Machine. We think we have something that honors the legacy of the Karate Kid in, in a real way, but also is funny and different and feels fresh. And probably went a little more detail than that. And, you know, we, we, I think he heard our passion and our sincerity in the situation and he arranged for us to have a lunch with Ralph. So we, uh, Mexican. We, no. Um, I don't remember what the restaurant it was, but it was someplace in New York and, uh, it was, uh, at some hotel and you guys meet at the hotel, meet at a hotel. You put the three of you were there before he gets there. The three of us are there. You got to be. Yes, I'm sure we were. He walks in and you all stand up. You've never met before and you have to do the the handshakes around yes. and the names and okay, okay, okay. You sit down, probably a little a little bullshit, a little banter. Yeah, a little bit, a little Any bit. drinking? Yeah. No, this was this was uh just a nice casual lunch meeting. Okay. Uh but everyone orders food like an entree. Everyone you're actually dining yes. together. Yes. Yes. And then you go into it and you say, we, we told him the pitch. You know, I, I, I don't remember, again, all the specifics of it, but what you saw in season one of the show 
much of that we said during this four hour lunch that we you had told me a lot of that when i watched yes. it i i heard uh it's interesting that you said um what you got from zapka from the from the uh not the behind the scenes yeah the 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 bonus content or whatever yeah, yeah, it was yeah, called. Yeah, sure. Because that's what you told me, which is obviously what got you hooked, which was when you think about it, here's a guy that has no dad. Um, his only father figure is this guy who's a horrible person that is not only conditioning him poorly, he also abandons him, mm-hmm. mistreats him. He loses his girl. He loses the 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 karate. He loses this tournament, this yeah. thing where he put all of his energy He's got. Where is? Yeah, he's got to be hard. That's got to ruin. Yeah, somebody. everything. That's so much trauma. Exactly. Everything. That at the time, the audience didn't know what Johnny's home life was, but what we knew was that he mm-hmm. had this father figure, who in Sensei Kreese, who was teaching him a toxic form of karate, and that he was brokenhearted about this girl. And you know, in his mind, probably it's like if I when I win this karate tournament, she's gonna, you know, she'll she'll come back to me again. Right. Like I think probably in his mind. And uh, yeah, he loses the tournament. He's lost the girl. And then his father figure, who is upset that he lost, uh, nearly murders him in the parking lot. So, you know, his whole world came crashing down. You also told me um, that, and meanwhile, uh, Machio is, is it Machio or Macho? It's Machio. Machio. He wins the tournament, and I thought this was so funny because this is not how the world works. Now he's the guy, you yeah, know? Yep. And now he has, at the time, you told me it was LaRusso Lexus, which alliteration yes. will always work for me. Initially, it would have been LaRusso Lexus, and then uh, it fell through. Because like, you couldn't you know, get Lexus? There was, yeah, something like we couldn't get Lexus. You were able to get the rights to Karate Kid and all the people involved, but Lexus didn't want to it's, be associated. It's all of that stuff. That, there's so many lawyers and red tape involved in every every element of that. That it's just ludicrous. But it should have been LaRusso Lexus. We designed it where, like, oh, there was a great logo that looked like LaRusso, like with LaRusso in like the Lexus letters. It was awesome. I noticed you still kept LaRusso Luxury something. Yes. That, that LL. For whatever yes. reason, that's yes, like, we did. that hits. But the thing that was, the thing that was funny was um, later in the season, you see uh, Tom Cole, who is like his rival, uh, who's Daniel LaRusso's rival car dealer, mm-hmm. and he, ha- he sells Lexus. Oh, I didn't make that connection. Yeah, we, we're not we're not calling it Tom Cole's Lexus, right? But he has Lex. He's selling uh, Lexus there. So I, I have some silly silly questions that I don't know if these are nerdy Karate Kid questions or nerdy directing writing questions. Sure. Um, but one in particular was, and here's spoiler for those who haven't checked out Cobra Kai yet. This is the end of this of the series. Yeah, they should watch the show. So watch it. Um, come fa- back. Come back in five hours. Fast forward uh, a minute uh, from this. <laughs> Crease comes in at the very end. Yes. And the door uh uh, uh LaRusso or not LaRusso. Uh Johnny is 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 in his 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 uh studio. What do you call it? Your dojo. His dojo, yes. And in walks this mysterious figure and you only see he's dark. You only see the outline. You hear a voice, but you're not quite sure what it is. But yeah, you do. Like uh, it's Crease. It's obviously Crease, but it's still shot dark and then the score even builds up to the very end while he's walking forward he finally steps into the light and now we see he's not dead there he is what's to come my ridiculous question for you is when directing that it's directed as a reveal sure but we know what it is do you do that assuming that some people may not know some people did not know and that's it you know we knew when we were doing that that there are people who are going to hear the voice and immediately know who it is or even see the shadow and be like oh that looks like it's crease shaped in a sense um but the truth of the matter is a lot of the audience was slowly putting it together and that was sort of the goal with it it's they're slowly putting it together and you probably for a lot of the viewers before he comes into the light you know it's crease but a lot of people are like is that because we say a few episodes earlier that he's dead. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think most of the audience is taking that at face value. And, uh, you know, for a period of time, certain viewers, probably most viewers, aren't quite sure that it's Crease until like later, right, you know, later in the game. That got me so excited for season two. Um, you're going to love Crease in season two. You're done shooting, right? It's got to right. be. It's coming out in, in like two few weeks. weeks. Two, right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, 10 episodes? 10 episodes. And, um, when you did season one, it's 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 all written out before you even start shooting. Sure, just I mean, that's most that's of streaming it. stuff will work, right? Well, most of it, you know, we we had before the first season, 
we probably had five or six episodes completely written. And then you know, the final four were in process where you knew the outlines um, and you know either writers were working on them or we were going to write them later on during production. And I saw that you didn't direct all of them. No, no, it's it, it's just too much, too time consuming. You don't want to direct them because it's too much for you to do. It's too. We we have we just have way too much to do. Yeah, we don't. You, in a sense, you're directing all of them, even though you're not directing all of them when you're the showrunner of the show. Yeah, I find that in, in television, the the writers are are the the kings, and in movies, it's the director. Exactly. So you know, we we were directing the first. We Hayden and I directed the first two episodes for the purpose of sort of getting it, you know, all. Um, you know, starting it off in the right way and setting the tone and showing everybody kind of what it was. And then we had, you know, another director come in and do the next two episodes. But we're there on set. You know, one of the three of us, if not all of the three of us, are on set with the directors, making sure that we're getting everything that we need. If we see performances off, we're talking to the director or talking to the actors ourselves. Um, you know, we're, we're making sure that we're not going to find ourselves in the editing room missing anything. So when we're not directing, we're still helping direct, but we have, we're writing, like we wrote the final two episodes mm -hmm. of this, of that first season also. So we needed some time where we're able to, you know, step away from the set when we need to. Considering that this universe and the physics of this universe existed before you were part of this project. And also considering that there is your perspective. There's three people's perspectives in it. Sure. There's there's rules already established. There's rules being created. Is that difficult to do with people? Do you guys butt heads on anything? Um, and if yeah. uh, if so, was there anything that you guys disagreed with that you lost? Hmm. You know, we. It's funny. We agree with on most things on the show. Um, you know, we talk it out. I've been working with Hayden for, I guess about 20 years now. I mean, even in college, we started writing together. Mm -hmm. So we've been writing, to, we've been working together. Whom, which I, by the way, I met uh, at that Hawaii dinner, who the, the two of, the relationship you two have with each other is a marriage. Oh, totally. It's, the, it's unbelievably cute. He's <laughs> so nice too. Oh, he's great. He's awesome. So yeah, we've been, we've been. And that translates in the working world. It does. We've been friends for 25 years and working together for like 20 years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we've had, many years of needing to compromise and everything that we're doing and we share a vision with what we're doing one of us will come up with something the other person may disagree with it and you talk it out and you find the best solution we don't really care where the best idea comes from between either of us or when you're making a, a, a movie or tv show there's a million voices from the actors to other producers to studio executives wherever the best idea comes from is where is what you should be using um, and you know, the same goes with this, the three of us ha have talked it out at length of what we saw the show as there are times where one of us will pitch something and we're like, the two of us will be like, that doesn't quite fit tonally, or that's a bit much. There's too many Karate Kid references that feels it's bordering on parody. Or Can you give me an example of a Karate Kid reference? Uh, you because mean, it is the Karate Kid. So what do you, what do you, what, what I, mean? what I mean by that is a nod to something that happened in the past, like Hey, how about we do this song during the scene? Right, and we're like, when he did uh, the, uh, one that I, I I laughed out loud when, uh, and again, spoiler alert, kinda in the final episode when Johnny's kid gets injured and uh, he puts his hands together and wipes them, but also the the drum sound when the hands sure. clap, and I I thought while I knew it was coming. Because they're in the locker, it's it's there. But I wasn't sure, is he going to actually help him yes. or what? And then when it happened, I'm like, oh, what's the... I mean, Miyagi, for that to <laughs> exist, Miyagi, there's some cultural training that is built in his blood from exactly. generations. Daniel LaRusso didn't learn how to do this. And I was like, what's going to happen here? And then he calls the medic, and I laughed out loud at that. So that's a nod. You're just that, saying that, references. That's, that's a nod, and we love, we love that on the show, but it's picking and choosing when to do it. It's, you know, there was a scene that we shot in season two, which had a number of nods in it. And I remember watching it in post and we're just like, it's just too much. Like you don't need all of that. It feels like we're shoving it down your throat and it, it just didn't feel subtle. It didn't feel right. I, I could, you, I could do, I could take one a minute. Um, I, you, what you're, you know, you know what you're doing and obviously that's right but because you don't want it to be a parody well, and well, that, you want it to stand on its own. That's the thing. Like the biggest thing for us is, you know, we, uh, we obviously come from comedy and we wanted it to not be, you've seen Karate Kid parodies a zillion times for the last 35 years. Like, you know, whether, playing You're the Best Around over a training montage in a, in a silly thing. Or, of course. You know, you've seen 
that kind of comedy associated with Karate Kid for a really long time, that wouldn't sustain itself as a series. What's better to us is you're living in the world. It, it, feels, it feels real. And it feels real. It feels like this is a, a time dash, 100%. Yeah, and, and I think, so within that, we'll have little nods to the past here and there. Sometimes it is music. Like I love in, in uh, episode seven uh, where they go to golf and stuff and we did some shot for shot uh you know uh, parallels you had, had the, the you had the original apartment which blew my mind yeah, we went to the original apartment how do you find where these things are well this was this was really fun it was like Hayden Josh and I were we shoot most of the show in Atlanta mm -hmm. so we were uh within a week we were going to be leaving for Atlanta before season 1 and we're like okay let's drive around the valley and go to areas where go to some of the locations that you could find on the internet certain locations from the original movie and let's sort of drive around there and just drive around the valley in general and we were like hey we let's look where daniel's old apartment building was because we were under the impression that it got torn down so we're like let's find where it used to be mm -hmm. and we pulled up and it was there there was a reference to the three palm trees which i don't remember from the original yes. what was what was the point of that uh well, one of the trees was gone or yeah, something? one of the trees was gone and you just wanted to acknowledge that? We just acknowledged it, yeah. Because <laughs> you rewatched it and you notice there's a tree missing and you just said it. Yeah, exactly. And then the, the, then by the pool, there was like some stones that you showed. That this Then the, the back flash you showed was the same part of the pool. Mm -hmm, yep. You see that stuff and you're like, we have to use this? Sure. I was, it, was, it was one of those things where like, well, this is a location that it, the fans of Karate Kid know well. Right. And, and there's an emotional connection to. And for Daniel LaRusso, if he's reflecting on his childhood, this is a man who's become a huge success and now has a beautiful home in the Encino Hills. You know, he's driving by his old neighborhood and, and you know, remembering where he came from. I'm sure it was great acting, but it also seemed like not just Daniel LaRusso, but Ralph Macchio, when he was in that apartment and was just looking at it and taking it in, like, wow, this is amazing. I felt that that the actor was also feeling like, this is uh, amazing. Like, this was as long ago as it's supposed to be. He was there. Absolutely. Like, that. that's the thing that's really fun with these actors is they really enjoyed making The Karate Kid. They loved the experience. They had lifelong friendships. Like, Billy, Billy Zapka is still to this day very close friends with all the Cobra Kai's. Like in, oh, yeah? in a real way, like where he sees them fairly frequently, talks to you know some of them on the phone often. Um, he did, knows these. Did guys. you ever think about having any of these guys be part of it? We think about everybody who's ever been in the Karate Kid movies as potentially showing up on the show at some point. Okay. Yep. <laughs> very cool. Maybe one day those guys will be on. Yeah. We'll very see. cool. Um. So. So you're done with, with season two. You can't talk about it. Uh, I'll probably ask you some questions when this turns off. But it was... Um, the show was tonally is nothing like Karate Kid. Um, I don't know if that's a compliment, an insult, or irrelevant. But it wasn't... The, it wasn't I mean, it's not the 80s anymore. Sure. But it, it felt so... It felt like this was still the same world. Obviously, it's the same actors, so it's got to at some sure. point. But you did such a good job referencing things, either showing it when when he when Larusso was training Johnny's kid. He talked about that waterfall, but that didn't exist anymore. So we took him to a new place. You even did a a, a ridiculous bit that that was a runner throughout about the color of the mats, yes. which I thought was fun. That's one of my favorite things. Is that just a random? No, nope, for nope. those who haven't seen it, the rats, the mats were red, and in this they were blue, and the color of their fists were different. And there was just a lot of to do about whether or not the council was going to allow this to happen. Well, that, that's the, my favorite thing. It's you know the thing about this show is. It is dramatic, like the Karate Kid, but it's more comedic than the Karate Kid. Part of it's because right. you go th in through the Cobra Kai angle. Like, at th let's take a step back for a second. There was a teenage karate gang basically terrorizing kids in right. high school in the eighties. That it, that in itself is hilarious to us. The fact, that, like, for us, the greatest comedy of the show is just the fact that we're doing the show and taking Johnny Lawrence's life really seriously. We earnestly care about his his world his history the character and what's going on there so that it inherently leads to some comedy but you know getting back to the mats like we love the idea of because this is a five-hour movie in a sense like you know you have 10 episodes 30 mm -hmm. minutes each 
you know, you get to deal with the minutia that you wouldn't see in a movie. And the minu- it's just the minutia of like, okay, so somebody put on the tournament. Like back in the day, they had the karate tournament. We didn't see any of that. Here you get to see the guts of it. Daniel LaRusso is part of like the karate board. And they're like, they have to make yeah. decisions. of like, Which I thought was a so pathetic. Like, yeah. you know, he won this thing when he was 17. Exactly. And for 20 years, he's part of this board every year. Yeah, well, he's been on this board. Like, you know, the LaRusso the, the Auto Group is one of the sponsors, sponsors. of this thing. Right. And, you know, in his, in his ads for his... Uh, you know, for his uh, auto group, he you know chopping prices and giving uh-huh. away bonsai trees and stuff like that. Which, you, which we always in our minds, Daniel just is coming from a like a place of love for Miyagi and honoring Miyagi. He's not really thinking about like the commercializing of any of this stuff. He's just like, this is what I love. This is what I believe in. Like, and he's like giving away the bonsai tree. He thinks it's just a nice thing to do for the customers. When in reality, it's kind of like. It's it made, a weird it made me think of in Little Giants when Ed O'Neill's character, who played high school football, possibly college, but never pro, and he had the he, his car dealership was it was on on a football field and just like this living in the past, but still being successful in this small pond. Yeah, well, we always say on the show that. In the San Fernando Valley, karate is like football in Texas. You said that in the show. I thought that was great because yeah. one of the kids says, this has been going on for 50 years. Am I out of the fucking loop or something? Exactly. Yeah. Nobody knows. Well, yeah. The whole world stops during this yeah. under 18 <laughs> karate tournament where, by the way, some of these kids are doing flips and shit or have got to be, you know, Olympians. <laughs> we have a really great stunt team. <laughs> um, also... Uh, I, if I could find a way of pulling this clip up, ripping it, and putting it on, I'll show you here on the, on the YouTube version of what I'm talking about. But there was a bit where, because uh, Johnny's teaching all the nerds, and one of them competes who's four foot eight, maybe, and is wearing glasses, not even sports goggles. Yes. And there's this American Ninja Warrior who literally his first <laughs> move was a spinning flip over him and then yeah. just kicks him down. Yep. This is so funny. And it's so funny to see, see like, the karate kid which took this thing so seriously and didn't acknowledge the fact that this is not what the world is and to still have that be the honest world but poke fun at it as a as a comedy writer which you are that must be such a fun thing to take something that was serious and deconstruct it and have ownership over it it's the best it's it, i couldn't love the job more um i think that we just tone is everything when mm-hmm. it comes to like you know comedy filmmaking comedy uh, you know, because you're creating making. the physics, you're yeah. creating what is possible and what is not. Exactly. So you know, we believe we try to make sure that it feels like everything that's happening, for the most part, could just could happen in real life. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, there's little the winks and nods, but technically, somebody could say the line that is that wink or nod, or you know, if the the music is playing, it's just setting the tone in the background. Uh, you know, uh, young hearts playing during the golf and stuff thing, like it did years mm-hmm. ago. You know, you make these choices that are going to give people the feels in a certain way. Is the golf and stuff? Is that in Oxnard? I believe it is because I've been there. I, I went there once. My aunt has a house in Oxnard, and I went there. And and this this looked like I think this is the place from Karate Kid. Yeah, so it's not it really is. Encino. No, that's that. I believe it's in Oxnard. Yeah, um, I've, I've gone putt putting there. Yeah, we. Uh, but we shot. Uh, in it, we shot in Atlanta. We got we you know there were a number of games that they had from the original Karate Kid. We got we had them bring in some of those games. Oh, but the exterior wasn't even there. The exterior, only a portion of it. We we took a we comped a shot from the original Karate Kid for the sign. Um, everything good there? We comped a shot from the original Karate Kid and uh, of the sign at the beginning when you're introducing mm-hmm. golf and stuff. So that's actually the same shot from the original Karate Kid movie. And then when it pans down, you're in our new location, which was our own, an exterior somewhere in Atlanta. Hmm. Is this your first time doing television? Uh, it is in a real way. Because you said it's uh, five hours because it's 10, 30-minute episodes. And I, I noticed that there were certain, and maybe... Maybe that's because I haven't watched... When I watched this, I, I came to your, your premiere, where I believe it was two episodes or three? Two. Two. And then there's eight more. as a quick... Wa- Normally, I don't watch... I, I binge shows, but I don't really watch an episode, a, a series in a, in a sitting. Sure. But this one... So maybe this is common, but I noticed it seemed that at episode five, um, we, meet, we meet the mom um, and the, the kid... It was five, I think, we met the mom. Uh, you mean Daniel's mom? Yeah. It's actually episode eight. 
mm, then I'm remembering things wrong. But uh, the kid who was, uh, who was the who was bullied, who then became kind of aggressive because he's learning the Cobra Kai, he seemed to have a little bit of a turn sure. around that. It just seemed like there was a midpoint. Is that a common thing with with in television, or was this like you wrote this? Because your experience is filmed like a five-hour movie. We our thought was that we wanted there to be kind of like a mid-season finale in a sense. That um, we liked the idea of you're building to something, and every episode we try to end every episode in a way where you're like dying to see the next sure. episode. And then when it comes to when it came to the episode five, we wanted some big seismic shift to be happening that's making you thrust into the rest of the season and see what's what's going to happen from there. And in in season one, it was. You know, there were two main things was on the Johnny side, he suddenly had a, an influx of students after struggling to mm -hmm. get his dojo off the ground. For Daniel, it was realizing that he's let this rivalry kind of consume him and turn him into basically an asshole. And he needs to kind of recenter himself. And he goes back in the do. He goes to Miyagi's yeah, grave. Yeah, and also was um, when they go back to Miyagi's stu studio, is that the original location? Because it looks like it. Uh, you mean at the very end of the season? Yes. It's no, we rebuilt it. You rebuilt we it. We rebuilt that for for forty five seconds of 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 screen plot time. Yes, with the knowledge that we were likely Coming to have a, that we would likely have a second season, and uh, we would be using that as a primary. Now, how do you rebuild season. it? Do you have to get the art design? Do you just do it from looking at the movie? I mean, does somebody somebody has blueprints to this? Because it, as well as I remember it, it looked just like it. Our production designer is fantastic, Ryan Berg. Shout out to Ryan Berg. We'll yes. throw up his Instagram. Please do. Um, he, you know, what he, they pull images of every time you've been in in Miyagi's backyard, and they're able to sort of he and his team are able to visualize it and understand scope and under and just figure it out. It was great. Yeah, it's it's great. It's 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 beautiful. When um, we saw the yellow car, I legit got goosebumps. That is the actual yellow car. Yeah. That's the one Ralph Macchio actually owns that car. Does he? So he had it. Oh, that's cool. He had it. There was no engine in the car. You know what? I'm, uh, I stand corrected in one sense. In season one, when you see it there, uh, we didn't. We hadn't shipped Ralph's car down because he didn't have an engine in it. We hadn't shipped the car down yet. We got... Uh, just a car that was almost exactly like it and you know it's mostly covered up in season one you just mm -hmm. see like a little glimpse of it in season two where the car is more prominently featured we actually got ralph's car down to atlanta which is the original and we um put an engine in it for him and uh it was now workable it's a nice little perk a little perk yeah i think that's the, really the only reason he did the show is hoping that eventually we'd get him an engine um what a yeah what a i feel like it's not can't be that expensive more, it, it was, there was like eighty grand of of work because you into needed that car. it to, to work. Yeah, you needed it to work, and it was you know all I knew very I'd get something parts. out of you. Yeah, so you money. heard it here first. Season two has a working yellow car in it. it so does. spoiler, it does. People might find this out before this. Now that you've done television, and you have been very successful with this show, is is that the plan? As moving forward, do you want to? You're, you're, I know you're doing uh, um, the new American Pie. That that's incorrect. Is that not true? No. Since American Reunion, there's been rumors on the internet that we're doing another American I've, Pie. I, movie. I've seen those, and then I I, I I I double sourced it by checking your IMDb. IMDb is is just incorrect. There was a period of time, very briefly, when we, when right after we made American Reunion, and we were talking with the studio about maybe doing an American Pie five, but there's the business of an American Pie movie is very complicated. I don't. I can't get into the specifics. There's just too much there. But there's a lot of people who had very high inflated salaries as a result of, you know, how huge the second, third movies were. That it became cost prohibitive to easily make another American Pie movie. American Reunion was an exception where they, you know, they put it all together there. But to make another one, it's really, it's really tough. So that's, uh, uh, as far as public information is concerned, and I'll take you at face value, it ain't happening. It ain't happening anytime soon, as far as I, as far as I know. So do you think, you think the next project is going to be TV again? Do you have a s specific relationship with YouTube now that they love what you've done and you, they want to do more? You know, we may do more things at YouTube. YouTube is constantly shifting their strategies. We know that they want to do Cobra Kai going forward in terms of their Do you other... have a season three already? Uh, we do not have a season three already, but... 
it's looking very likely that we'll be doing a, a third season of the show. I and think I know what that means. That's cool, though. Yeah, so uh, it feels like there will probably be a third season of the show. And, you know, the, everything that they say to us is basically they hope to be making Cobra Kai for many years to come. So our hope is to be doing more Cobra Kai. Uh, but, we, you know, we've uh, developed a really great relationship with the people at Sony, who's the studio involved. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, our hope is to do more television shows, Beyond Cobra Kai, continue Cobra Kai, and also do movies. So it's figuring out sort of the right balance, where to put our our time and energy, and how we can, you know, help you know other people whose work we're fans of, you know, get their stuff going. So correct me if I'm wrong. A half hour of television is is approximately five to seven uh, five to seven days. You mean uh, to shoot? Yeah. But, yeah, yeah, roughly. You know, but you don't shoot in order on a show like this. You you shoot generally in order in terms of like in terms of, you know, we we shot it in blocks. So it'd be the first two episodes were one block, and then the mm -hmm. next two, the next two, next two. So you have but, five blocks. Each block is what two, three weeks. Each block is ten days of shooting. So you do two episodes, five days per episode. Five basically. days per episode. But it, it's a very ambitious show for that kind of schedule. It's, it's, it seems like it. It's insanity that we had that kind of a schedule with it. So there were so many locations. Yeah, so many locations. A lot of fight scenes. Yeah, a lot of choreography. So we had a lot of double up days where there's two full units uh, shooting at the mm -hmm. same time. So while Hayden is on one set directing something, I'm on another set directing, or Josh is on a set directing, and Hayden's on a set directing, or a guest director. It's there's a lot going on. There was some days where we had three units going at the same time because we had we you know we have to play catch up and uh so like late in the season there can be a day where you're shooting stuff from five or six different episodes all in the same day over the over two different units so this is about two months of shooting time it's about two months of shooting time. so a television series of 10 episodes takes you two months while a movie that's probably less than two hours takes what three four uh to shoot yeah it's we we had roughly 50 days of shooting for uh cobra kai season one or season two and you know the harold and kumar movies were like 35 36 days of shooting oh that seems so fast those were fast american reunion i think was roughly 50 days so american reunion which is you know an hour and 45 minute movie or something yeah. like that versus five hours of content it's you're hustling yeah. in television. Now, why does TV move so much faster than film? Is it because you don't get as cinematic of shots? Because this seemed pretty cinematic. Our goal was to make this really cinematic. It's really just... Uh, it's it's hard for me to explain. I could say this. Now, having made television the way that we've made television, I have more confidence in being able to shoot uh, movies even quicker than... you know Because you it, were forced? It, it always feels... Yeah, I think you're just forced to... You have a, a limited amount of time. And you find a way. It's it's the combination of double up days, and you know, even though I think the movies that we've shot often have had many different locations, a lot of road trip kind of things. Mm -hmm. So you're every day you're in a new location and you're on location. On Cobra Kai, um, we have many sets now, and we have certain locations that you go back to frequently. So you may you can be economical about the which way happens you're if you have the luxury of having a second season, but you didn't have that the first time. Well, the first season we had. Uh, you know, on stage, we had like the Cobra Kai dojo, the interior of the Cobra Kai dojo. We had, um, uh, we actually, uh, on stage, actually, we built the exterior of Johnny's apartment. Uh, uh, what does that mean, the on stage? The on stage, the, the stage. The apartment that he lived in when he was a kid? No, no, that's Dan that's Daniel's apartment. Oh, oh, yes, I'm yes, yes, we yes built, I understand. We built Johnny's apartment, the right. exterior of it, in our parking lot. And inside, we had Johnny's apartment. Mm -hmm. We had Miguel's apartment. So we had, like, and, and then some other apartments, like Robbie, where Robbie lives. There were a number of things that we had. Um, and then there'd be, even be stages, like, you know, Johnny's stepfather, Sid. We took, we re <coughs> we repurposed, like, a stage from some other show that had been there and used the walls and some of the el elements of it and then redressed the whole place. What is your, because the entertainment business has shifted a lot toward television. Sure. And whenever I'm talking to people that, that um, for, for projects that I'm writing and working on, uh, there's two movies that I'm working on and I'm being sold on, can this be a television show? And it seems that people don't want to make movies anymore. Now, when you're at the highest level uh, of writer, director, actors, that, that doesn't really hold. But as far as getting movies made versus getting television made, considering how many outlets there are, 
do you, being someone who has had their success in movies first, still believe that television is something easier to get produced? It definitely is. I mean, I love making movies and I hope to make movies for years to come, but it's harder to make a movie these days through the studio system. Why? Uh, because most of those movie studios are now owned by larger companies that everything is run, run everything through the numbers. So if you're making a movie at Universal, they say, okay, well, does it have The Rock in it? Does it have Seth Rogen in it? Does it have- But what about you know, budgeting a movie the way, you know, you, you did this, you did five hours of content in 50 days. They could give you half that budget for a movie that doesn't have The Rock in it, but people are watching television shows. They think they're not going to watch movies. I, I, watch, I watch a movie a day. Well, the big difference is is if it's a major studio movie, beyond the the cost of making the movie, it's promoting the movie and getting people out to the theaters, and and that that alone is ranges between twenty million dollars and yeah, fifty million. People are going dollars. to theaters to watch television. Sure, exactly. Which that that's I but guess YouTube, the, Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Apple, all of these. Well, see, it's it's easier to get movies made through them, right? Than it is to make a theatrical, uh, a big theatrical movie. You know, I, I think it, it when you when if if there, it's easier to get a movie made without stars, and that they're getting. It's all getting back to why television is easier. Is people don't. Re, the, because they don't have to advertise, spend the same amount of money to advertise the show and get eyeballs on it as you do getting people to a theater for movies, you're right. you're able to not have the pressure of having a huge star that's on that poster. That's yeah, I know. One of the uh, I remember when I first started working, I one of the things that st that I didn't believe and, and was there are movies that have a uh, two million dollar budget and their marketing budgets are ten million dollars. The marketing is is generally at at least double of what the movie cost. Yeah, it depends on the movie, but the marketing is very high. If you're doing if if you're doing a movie at you know Universal or Warner Brothers or Disney, these days it's really only worth their 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 money to or, or in their minds a lot of times it's worth their money to do these huge tentpole you know superhero movies. A lot of them are that. Um, that have big property, big spectacle, the the, the theater going experience. You know, it, to get a comedy made, it's a lot harder than it used to be. When we made Harold and Kumar go to White Castle, we made that movie for nine million dollars, and it was not because of John Cho and Cal Penn's star power. They were both, you know, relatively new to the game. But it took at the time we needed to get some recognizable faces that they viewed as stars. So. We paid for a, and you were uh, told that that was like direction to yes, we need faces. Yes, we need. So we paid for a half a day of Jamie Kennedy working on the movie. It's kind of like how people pay social media influencers now to be in their projects. Yeah, it, it's it's so weird and so backwards, especially for me when it comes to comedy. I believe that you want the funniest. Yeah, you want you want the it. funniest person, and you want somebody. Oftentimes, when you see the same actor over and over and over and over again. You, if it's a story that you're like connecting with in the real world, sometimes it takes you out of it a little bit. A lot of the biggest comedies of all time had fresh faces. Yeah. You know, the original American Pie, no one was famous in there. I always, Seth Rogen in Knocked Up was not famous. I always Fortio felt Virgin. that, uh, 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 I always feel that British comedies, even though, because I don't know a lot of those actors anyway, they do such an interesting, good job casting, not just about being unrecognizable, but they just look like real people. And everybody now is so hot and ripped, even if I haven't seen them before. And I'm okay with it. I'm okay. Well, just only because you're hot and ripped. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I know you're fishing. But there. jokes aside, I I love looking at hot people. I love looking at hot girls. I love looking at hot guys. I love watching basketball players with wide shoulders. I think LeBron LeBron's body is just as cool as his dunking. I you give me hot people and good music and bright colors, I'm in. But it doesn't make it more believable. That's true. And I still don't understand why movies, if we're not talking theater, why aren't movies big on the streaming sites? Why aren't HBO, do, why aren't, doesn't HBO doing movies again? Well, the streaming sites are starting to do a lot more movies. They, and, absolutely. And, and, and they've had success. But so. the budgets are still way higher for those than television. 
Uh, they are a lot of them, but not all of them. I think there it's a lot easier if you have a you know movie that you can make for three to five million dollars that doesn't have any star power, but it's a cool concept mm -hmm. that fits within certain buckets that you know Netflix is like okay. Uh, we're, we need more stuff with teenagers and love stories and this, and it overlaps with all these things. And we could say, if you like this, then you'll might like this. And what does an episode of, of Cobra Kai cost? Um, I think it's like $2.3 million per episode. So one 30 minute episode yeah. is two to $3 million. Yep. Whereas a three to $5 million movie. Sure. The economics of that are wild, huh? It's crazy. Yep. It's amazing what we pull off uh, making the TV show. I, I, I it, as you know, when I think about it, also, it's like, especially when you see season two of Cobra Kai. That's the thing. Season one, I think, is fantastic. There's a lot of scope and all. You're that. happier with two, huh? I'm happy with both, but season two we got super ambitious because before the season they were sort of like, hey, like the first season was a huge hit, R right? Freely, you know, implying that there was going to mm. be more money to make the show, and there wasn't. So it was one of those things. We wrote all this stuff. We planned this very and you ambitious had the same season. budget for season two. Yes, in fact, less money to go on screen because certain other uh, you know fees went up. So it became the kind of thing where like we, which is what led to us having many days where we're shooting two units at the same time because uh, that saves money than shooting an extra day. Mm -hmm. So we were when you see the amount of fights that we have in season two because those are not quick to shoot. Um, and you just see the scope and the number of locations and uh, and what we have. The fact that we pulled it off in just over 50 days is insanity. All right. I want to talk a little bit about uh, what it's like to be an actual person and make this stuff. You have a family. Yes. You're in Atlanta for two months. Yep. You They, they visit. You visit. Yeah. I try to make sure that I'm home. Uh, my goal is to not be gone for more than 10 days from the, their lives in person. Uh, you know, every day. Do you I'm have obligations of going to school things too? Like, are any of your kids doing like, are they fighting? Are they singing? Are they playing sports? I go to things when I can. Um, I'm, I'm only gone. I mean, it's not only, but like I'm gone for a three month to three and a half month stretch. And I, and there are stretches where like I see them every five days and then stretches where it's 15 days and it's not ideal and it's not what i want I, I my preference would be we shoot the show in los angeles and i see my family You're saving that much money by doing uh, it in atlanta you, you right? save a huge amount of money to shoot in atlanta because of tax incentives for ta tax incentives and also just things cost less there too so the combination of both of those things leads to the money stretching a lot further what so, costs less locations cost less loca food costs less everything costs less so it's that's why the combination of that combined with the tax incentives makes it where if you want the scope that we have and to pull off what we were able to pull off what if we couldn't do it on the budget without shooting in atlanta i love atlanta to be honest i love the 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 crew there is awesome um they got great restaurants there i think it's a great city just doesn't have my family there. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, the toughest thing. So they'll come and visit me a few times. I fly home as often as I can. At what that's point, it. at what point, at what season is is it where you guys say, listen, YouTube, um, if we're gonna do this again, I'll do it, but I need to be home. Does that I, happen? I don't know for sure. It could. I I, I perhaps. Um, it all depends on sort of, you know, time and place and figuring out kind of what else we have going on. But you know, over the right now, the first two seasons, Hayden, Josh, and I were on set almost all the time. All three of us are there almost all the time. As you make the show more, and you have certain maybe directors that you trust more because they've now done the show, they've directed enough episodes of it, and they understand you don't feel like you have to be on set every time that they're directing an episode. As the actors really understand their characters better, um, you know, as, as the writers are, get stronger because they've done the show longer, it makes it where down the road it's possible that you need one of us on set at all times. So we're rotating in and out. Now we may we may also have other shows going in the future at the same time as Cobra Kai. So you know, hopefully you're shooting another thing in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. so you're able to be back more for that. So we'll see how it all unfolds. As of now, like you know, I have this fantasy of not being there all the time but at the same time i know that whenever i'm there i'm doing stuff that is helpful to the show um and you know the the hope is that going forward maybe there is a little bit more money where we can shoot 
six days per episode instead of five, uh, you know, five days per episode. So there's fewer double up days and there's less pressure for us to be directing two units at once. So there's uh, a couple of things I want to ask you that I meant to before we got into Cobra Kai, which sure. I knew would be the bulk of because, I mean, that's, it's, I don't know. That's just what I wanted to talk about, I guess. But you, you went to uh, University of Pennsylvania and mm-hmm. you're, what are you studying? I was a finance major. You're finance. Yes. I kind of want to know the story of how you go from being in PA to writing studio comedy, writing and directing studio comedy movies. Sure. What uh, that path is. Uh, well, yeah, everybody's path is different. My specific path was, you know, Hayden and I... See, was he in finance? He was not, uh, but he was at University of Chicago, but we're friends from high school. So Hayden and I in high school loved movies, loved comedy, like gobbled it up like crazy and talked about eventually making movies together. That said, you wanted to make movies together. An actor? Uh, no, this was like writing. You knew we you wa- wanted to. We love the Zucker, the Zucker brothers, the Farrelly brothers. That was those were the the biggest you know right. film influences. The people who made movies that when you go to the theater, everyone's laughing their ass off the entire time. Were you born late eight, late seventies? I was born late seventies, seventy seven. So you know the the goal was to do what those guys did. And at the same time, we're just, you know, kids from New Jersey who don't know anybody in the entertainment industry. So it feels like it's so foreign. So our thought was, okay, well, we'll go to college. You know, there was, a, you know, we come from the kinds of families where it's like, you do well in school, you go to a good college, you get a safe job and you make right. a bunch of money. So our at the time it was like, okay, well, let's r- try to write a screenplay together we never wrote a screenplay in high school because you're doing other things. The one thing that we wrote together in high school was, uh, you know, we were kind of known a little bit for like, would you rather's? Would you rather do this fucked up thing or that fucked up thing? You but, are known for that in in, a, in certain circles because you came up with the best would you rather. We would they come, had equal yeah, weight. Yes, we would come up with really funny equal funny and uh, funny would you rather's that did that were challenging. Give me an example of one. Um, I'm trying to think because it's been a while and I remember one one that was always weird to me was uh would you rather have uh bowling balls for testicles or pool slips for nickel nipples? Oh, they're all like they're all probably like one is they're both bad as opposed to both being good usually it wasn't two good things it was always bad things oh i, I mean i would have, probably say the pool st- sticks for nipples and then you just get those removed and you at least you have balls hypothetically yes yeah i mean but you know okay so it, this is th- this was th- your claim th- to fame the demon would not allow you to get them removed in our scenario okay so in 1990 so you, the demon is saying yes you must keep yeah, these nine, bowling balls yes exactly you must keep these things okay so th- th- that was just one but you know most of them that was like probably like the tamest one okay they were always very fucked up and uh so we were like hey let's write a book of these and try to get it made so we wrote like 250 of them and I remember like I go, went to like concerts and I'd be like in the parking lot and trying to meet girls and like I would get a group of people around me and I'd be saying these and it was always, it was like, it worked. I was like, okay, just audiences are liking these. This is really cool. You like did test groups. Yeah, test for groups. This book just, yeah, you just, yeah. Just, and you were 17? I was 17. Okay. So yeah, so I'm like. And you were able to draw crowds? People came around? Well, this would like usually it was just like socially with friends, but there were times when I'd be at a concert and I'd be in a parking lot and I'd be like, "Hey, I'd g- go over to a group of people and start saying these," and people would usually laugh. And you're and, reading them, and and some yeah, at, at that time I was reading them because we had written a bunch, and I was just testing it out a little bit. I remember I was a camp counselor and I would talk to the other counselors mm-hmm. and stuff, and I was like, everyone thought these are hilarious, so we're like, "Hey, let's try to get this published." So I go to uh, an urban out or no, excuse me, I go to a bookstore and I'm. Uh, you know, checking, okay, who publishes these kinds of books? So like I'm writing down like all the publishers and stuff. And then we're trying to get into college and did nothing with it. And it just, we spent all that time writing it, never followed through. So fast forward, it's two years later, I'm at UPenn. I'm a finance major, uh, same class as Donald Trump Jr. Um, Shout out to uh, yes, Donald Trump Jr. Yeah, DTJ, uh, the, the man. <laughs> you guys still buddies? Can we get him on the podcast? <laughs> I think we'll get him on the podcast. We've never been buddies. Uh, never been enemies either, but never been buddies. Um, uh, but uh, we, uh, I, I was you know, a finance major planning to be an investment banker, 
and realizing kind of what that means. It's like these crazy hours after after college doing stuff that I wasn't going to look forward to. Um, me And I remember it was my sophomore year and I'm at an Urban Outfitters and they have like the book section there. And I'm looking through it and I see literally the book, Would You Rather? And I pick it up and I open up the cover and there's like about the authors. And it was like two guys who look like Hayden and I, but like five years older, literally the same exact idea that we had, but somebody else followed through and did it. So that was- How did that make you feel? It made me feel- frustrated but also feeling like we could have done that had uh -huh. we just followed so through. It, it motivates you a little it bit. motivated me so literally that day i called hayden up and said we've always been talking about writing a screenplay move in with me this summer we'll have jobs that are continuing our paths to being a banker and a lawyer but let's write a screenplay and try so to jewish you know yeah exactly you be a banker and a lawyer eventually but let's let's be writers first yeah, writers. The, the goal was our goal initially was let's be bankers and lawyers and make a bunch of money and then once we've made a bunch of money, then we could like write movies like down the road. And then we're like, shit, like we're gonna have to do those horrible jobs for 20 years uh -huh. before that or more. And then we'll never get to writing. Um, so I was like, let's write now. Let's try to sell a screenplay before we graduate college. And that, you know, hopefully that'll work out. <laughs> so you guys are in the Midwest wanting to do this. We're in Pennsylvania. So he, he, um, he moves in with me that summer and we spent every night, we'd go to work and, Every single night, you know, we'd come home from work. It'd be like, have dinner at like six, be done at seven. And from seven o'clock till like midnight, every single night, we were just writing a screenplay. How do you know how to do it? Are you reading books? How do you no. know structure? Still have never read a book on screenwriting. No? Um, no. It was- Are you reading scripts then? Do you have access to no, scripts then? No, no. It was, it was just the feel, like we had seen a ton of movies. Right. So at first we're just writing and we wrote 250 pages on Microsoft Word. So it was, we didn't have, have the right program. Uh, we wrote an extremely long screenplay. Like Kevin Smith was from Jersey. So he would write movies, but they were not like real, they were not traditional Hollywood movies. Uh, and, you know, I think we had seen a book of his screenplays and they were not in any format that- Do you still have this first screenplay that you wrote? I, yeah, somewhere. So, but, so we end up writing it. And at first it's 250 pages of Microsoft Word. And, but we got everything out there. And then over the course of the next year, like I'm meeting people at college who might like somebody who's from LA and his dad was a producer. So he read a bunch of screenplays growing up, a kid who went to Temple Film School who like knew it, some film classes. It was a Temple Film School. Yeah, Tem yeah Temple uh, University's Film School. Oh, no, oh, no, no, oh, no. Oh, 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 I thought you meant no. like Sunday School. No, no, exactly. No, so these people like had read screenplays and they read our script and they're like, this is really funny. I love the material. It's really good, but like it needs to be like, you know, 110 pages, Microsoft or, or final draft. So we get final draft the next summer and we end up um, getting a script in shape. I should say that our goal at the time was to bring back the R rated youth comedy because we loved like Revenge of the Nerds Animal and House. Animal House and all that stuff. And PG 13 rating killed the youth, the R rated youth comedy for a number of years. So it, since, you know, over a decade, there hadn't been one. And we wanted to see the kind of movies that we. When did it come back? It didn't come back till like. It didn't come back until American Pie. Yeah. So what happened was we were writing in 98. American Pie comes out in 99. So we're writing in 98. We were writing this screenplay. And then I remember seeing the movie Cruel Intentions during uh, my junior year of, of college. And there was a trailer for American Pie for the first time. And I remember seeing the trailer. And I'm like, someone fucking did our movie. Someone did like, there's a masturbation scene that seems like it's the first scene. Our, our first scene is a masturbation scene. It felt very much like someone had kind of the same type of wavelength that mm -hmm. we had. And we ended up basically, I was frustrated, but I was like, that looks awesome. That's gonna be a huge movie. It ended up being a huge movie. And at the same time, we're like, we, let's get our script in shape because some now we're not gonna be the first, but people are at least making this kind of thing now. So didn't have any connections got the script in shape, senior year, um, <clears throat> you know, didn't know anybody in Hollywood. So we're like, okay, how do we get this out to LA? So it was the early days of the internet movie database, IMDB. And I were like, okay, well, the Farrelly brothers and uh, the Whites brothers had just made American Pie. I'm like, those guys, they're not gonna wanna talk to some college kids, but maybe like they know, like who knows them? So we look at the credits and we saw there was a common assistant director on all the Farrelly Brothers stuff and on American Pie, this guy named J.B. Rogers. And we're like, okay, we don't know what an assistant director is. We didn't go to film school. We didn't research that. We just were like, okay, how do we get in touch with this guy? So I called the Directors Guild 
and I said, hey, can I get contact information for J.B. Rogers, thinking that I'd get like an agent's number, and they just gave me his phone number. So I called him up. I left him a voicemail and said, I'm probably the last person you're hoping to hear from. I'm a college kid who, uh, you know, has a fan of your movies, but, you know, I think I understand why your movies work. Um, I, I've seen them a, a zillion times and I've watched them with audiences. I've seen them over and over again. And I think we've written something that works in a similar way to the kinds of movies you've been a part of. Maybe you'd like to read it. He called me back. And he read the script and he loved it and he passed it around in Hollywood. And so before we knew it, we had agents and managers calling us. And from the spec that you wrote. From the spec that we wrote. And we- uh, Good for you. Yeah, we moved out, we, we flew out to LA. I had an offer from Goldman Sachs for a banking job in LA. And they flew me out for like a cell weekend. And I was like, I'll stay for like a week. So you graduated college. No, I was still in college at the time. And I was like, uh, I'll, I'll I'll stay uh, you know I'll I'll stay for like a week and see if I like LA. Meanwhile, I had all these meetings set up with agents and managers. So I like went to Goldman Sachs, then spent the rest of the week with agents and managers. We signed with an agent and a manager. Script went on the market, and then a week later it sold. And at that point, I told Goldman Sachs no, and moved to LA and became a screenwriter. And nothing came from that movie. No, no. But what what did come from that movie was. The first experience, like working with a studio, getting notes, um, like learning the town a little bit. Uh, in that first screenplay, the friends of the main characters were named Harold and Kumar. And they were an Asian guy and an Indian guy because my my friends, Hayden's friends, you know, a lot of our friends growing up were, were Asian dudes and Indian dudes who were just like us, uh, didn't have accents. They were like the Harold and Kumar that you saw mm -hmm. later on. So in all of our early scripts, we were writing these characters, Harold and Kumar, and everything we did. And they were like- Where do those names come from? Are those real uh, people? There's a real Harold Lee. He's one of my best friends to this day. Shout out to Harold Lee. We'll put up the Instagram. Yes, you should. Um, and then Kumar was the name of one of my best friends who was Indian. His older brother had the name Kumar. We just liked the way Kumar sounded better than, than my friend's name. Um, and Harold and Kumar it was. And they, uh, you know, eventually being in LA, we wrote a few more screenplays sold some things, didn't sell some things, and then decided, you know, wouldn't it be interesting because no one else is doing this, let's take these characters that are our side characters and put them front and center in a movie. Why yeah. White Castle? Because to me, when I first heard about it, that's what made me want to see the movie. I just loved White Castle, and I thought, what a weird thing that, that has White Castle is part of this plot. It's It, it was... Hayden and I are a lot of time, you know, in our early days of L.A., we would work all day. We'd be writing all day. We would smoke weed at night, mm -hmm. and we drive out, drive out, and get burgers or get uh, donuts or whatever it is. And we always thought it was hilarious, or just you know, just something about America that like you're in Los Angeles and you're. It's like we love the Apple Pan is one of our favorite burger joints in L.A. And we would drive past fifteen burger places mm -hmm. to get to the Apple Pan, and it was because we really were craving this very specific burger. So we were setting our movie in New Jersey. We loved the idea of these characters having a very specific craving and not wanting to stop until they got exactly what they wanted. And White Castle is a, a place that's open 24 hours. A lot of them are. Um, they're not like on every corner. So like you might have to travel to get mm -hmm. there a little bit. You know, for me in childhood, my grandparents introduced me to White Castle. My I remember, grandparents were obsessed with White yeah, Castle. Yeah, exactly. So it was something that like meant something there. But beyond that, you know, Harold and Kumar go to White Castle is not just a movie about burgers. It's about the American dream. What, uh, it was an Asian guy, an Indian guy, White Castle. Mm -hmm. There was something about sort Stars of- Stars align. Yeah, it was, it was all of it together felt sort of just like the right location. It's just the title is a stoner's movie. Totally. The title is, the title was exciting. I, I, uh, uh, I don't even remember seeing the trailer. I just remember hearing that and like, yeah, I want to, I want to see that and I want White Castle. Yeah, it was- If I'm not mistaken, I got White Castle, we got White Castle after we saw it. You were at the Richmond you, movie theater. You were smart. Thank you so much. That's what you're supposed to do. Is it is it a coincidence um, that your brand was what American Pie w w did that hadn't been done in in 20 years, and then you end up doing the last American Pie movie? What's the, that? How's uh, that circle that, around? How that happened was, you know, we we made, um, you know, when we wrote Harold and Kumar, what gave us the confidence to write it was John Cho. 
it was seeing him in American Pie. He's the milf. He's one of the mm-hmm. milf guys. You're telling me? Yeah. Uh, he, I mean, he's one of the milf guys. So he doesn't have a lot of lines in the movie, but he was very memorable and hilarious. And it was. I think my, you know, John Dewalt, right? Yeah, of my, course. My, my, no, John, he's a huge American Pie. Fan. Uh, yeah, I think one year for Halloween, he or something somewhere he went as milf guy. That's awesome. Um, it, a thing that went on in college, right? At, so American Pie comes out before my senior year of college. And my real friend Harold um, looks enough like John Cho. He doesn't look like John Cho, but he looks enough like John Cho that that yeah that we would went like throughout college we'd be out with him and people would be like hey, or people would be like move like <laughs> like it was yeah, American Pie was yeah. so big when it yeah came it out. was huge it was enormous and people would see my friend Harold and there were people who genuinely thought he was the milf guy from American Pie. So we were, we ended up writing this movie. And then uh, after that, the Whites Brothers made a TV show uh, that was like a year or two for, called Off Center. And John Cho was on that show. And that's where we saw him really acting a lot more. And he was hilarious. He was like the Kramer of that show. Mm-hmm. He was just like this bizarre neighbor. And every time he's on screen, he was s- stealing the scenes. He was just so funny. So we're like, we can write a movie for this guy that's called Harold and Kumar. And he could play like, you know, a guy who's a sort of like our friend Harold. And so we wrote that for him. And the thing that was really funny was um, now we're friends with John for making the movies. And when we go out with John, people shout Harold to him, whereas they used to shoot shout MILF to, Her- mm-hmm. to Harold. So he, it's a weird, weird thing that's all come together. But getting back to, getting back to uh, American Pie, um, so John Cho be, is very good friends with the Whites Brothers from... They loved him when they made American Pie so much so that they made Off Center with him. And socially, they would hang out. So when we made Harold and Kumar, we would go out, we'd go out in um, in in Hollywood sometimes, and we'd get to see the Whites Brothers. We got we met them, talked to them. They loved Harold and Kumar. They knew we were real big fans of American Pie. And then over the years, there were other people that we met. You know, one of the producers, Craig Perry, is a producer of American Pie. We had met him in L.A., and he knew what fans we were. So a number of people involved with American Pie knew that we were real fans, that we had work that people really liked in town and out in the world, and that was like in the same ballpark. So when they were searching for, they decided they wanted to do American Pie reunion movie, they were thinking, okay, well, who's qualified for this? Who would be right for this and who might be interested in this kind of thing? So Universal called us up. And they asked us if we're interested yeah, obviously in are. this, and we were, and we went in there, and we had no doubt we were going to get that job. It was one of those things where it's like, wh- who, like, wh- those characters. So something like that happens. They reach out to a few people, and you guys come up with your own version of what it is. You, exactly. You pitch the story it is. There were other examples of, of American Reunion, maybe not even that title, but yeah. but uh, when people went in and and they picked your version yes and you just were confident in it i had no doubt because it was one of those things where i had seen american pie a hundred times mm-hmm. like i know it inside and out it felt to me like i knew those characters as well as anyone from my high school so i was we were around the age of a 10 year reunion we talked about we we had already been talking about hey maybe we could do a, like a high school reunion movie cuz we're at that age and it would be we had things to say about that and then to be able to use these characters that are famous all over the world that we knew really well and the world knows really well you already had the backstory which it's a, actually a very American reunion was a very similar exercise to Cobra Kai I was going to ask if there were any tricks that you learned from American reunion the biggest thing that i learned from American reunion was when we were making um when we were making that movie, there was all this pressure from the studio to try to make you fall like fall in love with like the young characters that we were introducing so in that, the movie, so, they, so they could continue, so that on. it could continue on. The problem with that is when you're making an American Pie reunion movie and you're bringing back 11, 12, right. 13 characters. There's no time. And, yeah, you have, you have an hour and forty minutes. Like no one gives a shit about the new characters. Right. They want to see the older characters, and they only care about the new characters as they relate to our older characters. So um, I like the younger characters in American Reunion, but they don't have a lot of depth. You're not in their story. You're in the story Mm -hmm. of everyone going to the reunion. The thing that's great about Cobra Kai is instead of having an hour and 40 minutes, we have five hours. So you're able to give ample time to, to Johnny and Daniel, who are only two people instead of 13. 
and you're able to introduce a wide array of new characters through those older right. characters. Meet Brett Ernst, the cousin, and, sure. and meet these new kids and their crushes and all those people. Exactly. Which does make the world, makes it a world. Exactly. It makes it big, which is fun. Absolutely. It was awesome. So then when you go into season two, uh, do you look back at season one and be like, oh, these were successful elements, so I want to broaden this out? Or is it just based on whatever stories you're creating? Does it's, that question make it, sense? Yeah, it makes sense. It's the stories, most of it's the stories we're creating, but part of it is the experience you have making the show, getting to know the actors, seeing like who really, you know, who's capable of what, um, you know, what you, you feel it along the way. Like there, there are characters... You know, I'll just use the example of, you know, Hawk and Dimitri are two characters from season one that while we were shooting the season, you thought we just thought the actors were fantastic and we thought that they were had a lot of range and um, you know, oh, could, cool. could do a lot. So the storyline that, that brought it out was because you liked the actors. Yeah, it was we already would have gone in that direction in some way, but because we really saw the performances of these actors, it made us lean into those characters a little bit more and you know uh, amp up those storylines in favor of others at times so we've about we've about run out of time um to 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 what is this on hour three or what no i'm just kidding we're at uh exactly what i said uh, at an hour 40 wow they okay, go they perfect. go around that but before and we, you know what? What I might want to do is I might want to do an ending now, sure. but then have a free run for a few minutes, and then we don't have to include it. Sure. So let's do a a, a, a a temporary, potentially actual ending. You guys heard it here first. Thank you so much for tuning in to Take Your Shoes Off with Rick Glassman. Today's special guest is John Hurwitz. John, thanks for coming in. Hey, and cheers. <laughs> cheers. I'm going to go this way. Ah, it's Hollywood on both sides. Yeah. Wow, this is you you sprung for the expensive one. Actually, it was uh it was um it was the only <laughs> that was the only was option. The option. <laughs> I have video of when I procured that mug 7 years ago. Really? I have it on my Instagram. Uh, I posted it a while ago. I'll repost it when this comes out. It was a little sketch I shot called The Worst Thief. Aha. Where I saw that and I wanted to film me stealing it at the Rite Aid Sherman Oaks. Okay. And there was a security guard who was actually there, so we asked him to step in and be part of it so okay. he wouldn't get mad at what we were doing. Ultimately, I paid for it. I paid for it. But it's really good. The mug or the sketch? The sketch. Okay. The mug, I did, the mug is working as a mug also. Yeah, the mug is good. It's yeah, a it's, good it's mug. It's a good mug. It's not as good as the sketch? or I wouldn't post a picture of the mug. I do want to post <laughs> this video. Is the reason why we did this whole thing... So that you could repost that video. You know, I I want to I want to broaden that question out into something a little bit more. Um, uh, what uh, oh, what I can't think of a word right away. I, I it's like bowling. It's like hitting four strikes and then getting an eight, and then it's like why am I even playing anymore? It's the whole thing's a philosophical. Way. Okay, sure. You so so you said is that why we set this whole thing up? So I want to tell you what I just calculated there. There's sure. a couple of options. First, there's the ex there's the objective existence, which is. You said this joke, you didn't mean it literally. I know that. I Logically, I know that. Sure. So that means if I answer you by saying, no, I'm kind of shutting down your joke. <laughs> but I am acknowledging, acknowledging the fact that you, I knew that you didn't literally mean it. But I'm shutting you down, so that's no longer an option. Okay. The other op another option is to go on with your joke and then say, yes, that is actually why I did it. Which I feel is a little bit of a an obligation on my end that I didn't subscribe to. Okay. I feel the same thing when someone says, How you doing? And now I have to tell them, Good, how are you? I don't wanna have to do this. Okay. So either I shut you down, I put myself out, or I go like this. <laughs> well, you got it. Da, 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 da. Thank you again for coming in. And that's disingenuous. Yeah, because it was not that funny. So if I didn't have to worry about your feelings while still being true to who I am, it would go something like this. Um, would you lead me in again? I don't remember the. So is, line. is this why you is, is so? It, is, yeah. Is, oh is yeah. It, so oh, yeah. The, the mug is good, but I'm not posting a picture of the mug. The video I'll post. Is that why we did this whole thing? No. Thank you guys so much. You know what I mean. But that's <laughs> yes. just so. And I'm caught in this. <laughs> did, did I put you in a tough situation? You. It has. It's. It's less to do with you and more to do with my lack of understanding of. 
of the disconnect between what people expect and what I feel comfortable with. Sure. And this is something that's way bigger than this, but it is sure. something that I've been thinking a lot about. And people say to me all the time, Rick, I never know when you're joking. And the truth is, I don't find jokes and sincerity to be mutually exclusive. Quite the opposite. A lot of times, I either i am not sure if somebody's joking, or I'm in a situation to where I know they're joking, but what am I going to say? No, 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 (laughs) that's not why I brought you here. So I do a little bit of both. I say the truth, but in a joking manner. And then people think I'm joking because my voice was silly. I don't know what I'm supposed to do, and I don't want... Also... I'm a type of person that is always doing jokes. And I didn't realize until recently that was a survival because I don't know what I'm supposed to say to you. So I now have this identity where I don't want to do jokes all the time. I don't want to have to do jokes all the time. Yeah. So what am I supposed to say? When you say, is that what you brought me on? Now I'm calculating so much and I just, I'm lost. So much so that I need to talk to you about it for four minutes. Listen, I'm glad that you did because it's... This is more valuable. You get more ads on your on your YouTube video now, right? Is this not going to go on YouTube? Oh, it's on YouTube. It's on YouTube. Yeah. So the extra four minutes, you're padding it. It's great. People are going to listen to the end. <laughs> there you go. No. <laughs> you know exactly. You don't. You don't. There's. I. I should just stop joking around with you. No, but yeah, yeah, I think that's, that's the thing. Here, here's. Here, let me. Let me. Let me add on to that. I like when people do jokes. I love jokes. Not every joke is a laugh out loud joke. No, sometimes they're just ban- it's playful banter. That's you know what I'm having a realization. I've known I've been di- exits are di- so banter is fine when you're riding the wave. Yeah. But once you get to shore, do I just walk on the beach no. and go? No, you fake a laugh. <laughs> you can't do that. Oh, I, there's, I, I, faking a laugh is the worst. Thing I ever. would, I would rather. A woman fake an orgasm. Well, you know, of course, the women are, are, I don't know what I'm supposed to fucking say. Yeah. All I'm saying is a fake orgasm to me means you don't know how to communicate. Yep. It's, you know, listen, I know I have a job to do, but how many, you pump, you touch, you move. If I'm doing something wrong, tell me, I'll figure it out. You know, I'm, I'm a capable person. But if I tell a joke and I, and I could tell, I know when, <laughs> I, it, it, it's, it's, it it I it makes I I hate it. So who would I who who would I be if I'm if I'm giving fake you're, laughs? You're keeping it real. I like how you're handling it. This is great. You know, whenever I reply to someone with an LOL, I will only do it if I actually laughed out loud. Good like, <laughs> is a laugh out loud. That's how you should do that. People throw out LOLs just to let people know that they were joking and they weren't laughing out loud. That's true. Am I? Am I getting too intense about this right now? Because I'm feeling my energy no. that shifted. Is this okay? I'm all right with it. What, what do I care? I'm good. I don't know. It's that, all fine. That's the point. What it's, do we? What do you care I don't, about? I'm cool. Whatever, however you feel is how you feel. I'm, 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 I'm hanging out. I'm riding the wave with you. Good. Yeah. There's an interesting dynamic between you and I, from my perspective, which <laughs> is I've known you for a while. I feel 100% safe and comfortable with you. Good. You're in the comedy world, so I feel that we're at least on that frequency. I also sure. feel more just because getting to know you and the Jewish and the silly and the and the immature, that's just kind of where I live as well. Sure. But still, we don't know each other. Not that Not that well. This yeah. is our fourth time ever, fifth time meeting, if you include the two times we met in Hawaii for the dinner and then when I got the weed. Yes. <laughs> we've, we've met five times. So, but it feels like so much more. It does feel like more. It does. I mean, part of it, we also have a common friend. You have a child, a childhood friend yes. who I met out here. He uh, was my babysitter. Well, more, him, his, my mom and his mom are best friends. Sure. But he babysat me for a while. Yeah. So the fact Shout that- Shout out to Todd Friedman, by the yeah, way. We'll put up his Instagram here. De- definitely do that. Uh, no, Todd- uh, I think that adds to the intimacy that we have, at least on my end. Probably more on your end, because Probably. to be honest with you, I, I know that we have that connection, but that's not in my conscious. When yeah. You texted me today about, uh, you made a joke about Todd, and I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? But like, I didn't make that connection. I think what I think it is, is something that is, is real. Yeah. When you have a Jewish guy from the East Coast... Midwest, maybe Jewish anywhere, but I grew up Midwest, East Coast Jews. When I went to camp, those were the Jews. Sure. There's just, I went to school with you. 
Basically. You know what I mean? Yep. Even though we didn't know each other, you kind of knew me. Yeah. I kind of knew you. There's something very familiar and fam- familial yep. about a Jewish guy who, and you never may talk about this, but this is how I look at you, and I mean this in the best way, Sure. who probably talks about farts all the time. My daughters do a lot more than I do now, but I do, yeah. I mean, there's enough you do. You said do-do. I do-do, yes. I'm still going to always picture you as a guy who talks. There's just something about, about yeah, that. Yeah, sure. So yeah, I feel safe, but also I wanted to like kind of talk that to you and see what your thoughts were and yours were uh, your thoughts were what do i care so you know i got <laughs> something out of it <laughs> i got something out of it no it's i care about what you're saying i uh, what do, i i, I it, i'm not getting worked up you know listen don't don't I, I enjoy my time with you good very very clearly like i i whenever we're together it's a fun time i like hanging around with uh, comedians i like hanging around with uh, east coast jews i like hanging ECJ. around with Yes, I like hanging around with uh, you know people who like to joke around, even if they don't, you know, know the the right etiquette in terms of faking a laugh. You are uh, <laughs> is now. Do you think the faking laugh? You think the etiquette is to fake the laugh or not to, or to know when to? I think the etiquette is to uh, kind of know when to and to kind of give your your scene partner something back, if that makes sense. Right. Absolutely, you have to give something back. Yeah. So that's it. Like you're you're. Uh, you know, every moment that you're in is uh, you're in a scene when you're riffing with somebody and joking around. And, you know, it's you hope that you're getting genuine laughs or you're hoping that they're continuing it on until you reach a point where there is a genuine laugh for both of you. Right. And that's when you get out on the beach and walk away. That's the move. Dude, laughs are everything, aren't they? Uh, they're the best. Love it. Is your wife funny? Oh, yeah. She's really funny. Yeah. Yes. Do you make her laugh? Yeah. Yeah. I make her laugh and she makes me laugh. My kids make me laugh. I make them laugh. These daughters sound like they 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 get it. They do. They do. They're both very funny. I remember when since I was a little kid, my mom always said to me, um, "Love comes and goes, um, and comes again. Like love is a feeling, probably a chemical thing. But you need to make sure you marry your best friend and make sure you marry someone who thinks you're funny. And I always I remember that, and I always thought that because like that's something my mom told me. But as I'm. I go on dates and meet people, intimate or otherwise. Um, maybe it's an insecurity, but when I'm not connecting with people on laughs, I can't. I well, can't even be around them. Well, that's not. Those aren't your people. I don't understand. There are people have boring friends, and I yeah. just don't get it. Okay. If somebody doesn't make you laugh or offer you something, I choose to spend my time with people who make me laugh and who I make laugh. Like, I I go out of my way not to get together with people who mm-hmm. don't make me laugh. I, I enjoy hanging out, having a meal, joking around. That's what I enjoy. So what if you got into finance? Do you think you would still have that DNA? Because I can't imagine yeah. you without it. I, I've always had that DNA, which is one of the reasons why I pursued what I did. But, you know, there are funny people in the world of finance. There are funny people in all... Never met know. a financial advisor that made me laugh out loud. Well, there once. Not, and I know a lot. I, I, I don't think... You know a lot of financial advisors? No, and I'm sure yes, some have made yeah. me laugh. I just yeah, took a strong no, stance yeah, on that. I did, I was like, I in was, fact, yeah. Mark, shout out to Mark Kirby, my finance <laughs> guy in New York. Actually hilarious. Yeah, well, that's the... I think a lot of people who are smart are funny in some way or understand yeah. comedy and like if 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 they're not making you laugh they're a good audience for you um and that was uh you know i like hanging around with people who joke around and that's it so th- uh this is something that may not need be said but i want to i'm going to talk i'm looking at camera because i'm talking talking to the audience here a lot of what this podcast was was me asking questions and hearing a lot of the behind the scenes of television and and a lot of it was factual and interesting but there wasn't that much banter and laughs no. and watch watch stuff because like when I watched Steve Carell or or well no, I was going to say Will Ferrell but that's not true I just rewatched the the the, the office when when he's coming in but sure. when I watch St- uh, Steve Carell or um or Vince Vaughn no Vince Vaughn's actually you know what I'm actually making bad examples but there have been some people I've watched that aren't funny when they're talking to you Steve Martin is a good version of, another example sure. of it. when I'm watching interviews and I've always been super attracted to that because 
up until recently, and I guess I probably still do, but I'm better at it. My value, ca- my value comes from being a good basketball player and being funny. I don't know if I'm that good at basketball, and I don't know how funny I am. But in my head, I'm Duncan, and I'm 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 the funniest guy in the world. So if people think I'm funny or a good basketball player, they want me around. So I I would try and showcase those things. Sure. And when I saw. Uh, the only two people I'm thinking right now are Steve Carell and Steve Martin or any of the other funny Steves. But when you see people in interviews <laughs> and they're not doing bits, there's something about it where I was always, I noticed they're cool because I know they're funny already and I feel like they already know that I know that. So they're not trying to be that. So it's a newer thing for me to recognize you don't have to be on. Part of what inspired me to want to do this podcast was talking to funny people and not doing bits. Well, that's the thing. It's interesting because this is a different you. This I know. I know you from. I know you socially, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know the four times we've hung out. This is five, the fifth. The fifth. Um, and more often than not, our conversations are not dissimilar to this. That said, there are times where you know you're on, and I like those times too. And then there's times where you're just having a real conversation. You know, I I, I think there's mo- there's there's uh, there are multiple sides to you. And I think that you should embrace all of them. That's actually super sweet, and thank you. Um, I that's part of that recent realization is there are multiple sides to people. Yeah, and I am. Uh, I I love hearing how things are made, and nothing you. I mean, we were laughing, but a lot of the stuff you no, said wasn't, jo- wasn't jokes. No. But it's so interesting to me. Hearing people talk seriously about stuff that when I watch, I don't think is serious is just super inspiring to me and how much then and you working all day and then going and then smoking pot and then going to get burgers and they go hand in hand of like when to be silly and when not to. So when I wanted to say, we'll end it now and then see if it goes because I I still have this like I'm getting hot even now because I I read something on you about the about weed and not wanting to talk too much about it. Sure. But I really wanted to smoke a joint with you on here. Yeah. Which I, we're not going to do. No, no. But when I said I want to do it the last five minutes, I wanted to I wanted to get in like a silly place. But having this conversation, closing where it is, I'm comfortable with it. But I do, I do need to find an ending. And okay. I need the ending to be like, I need it to be really poignant and powerful. Okay. So I, I don't mean to put you on the spot. But do you think there's any chance I could get you, and again, we could edit this down if you make mistakes, to do a rap? No. Ab- <laughs> Already no. <laughs> All right. You guys, thank you so much for tuning <laughs> in to, to blah, <laughs> blah, 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 yada, yada, with your guests, so on and so forth. Keeping it real, keeping it good. Blabbity blue.